Well, uh, thank you so much for having us. Um, I am uh, Suchi Sarya, I'm a professor at Hopkins. Um, I have worked extensively on uh, the intersection of causality and machine learning, uh, various aspects of it, but today we're gonna talk about what I think is a ex super exciting, important and timely topic. Uh, and then joining me will be Adarsh uh, Subhaswamy. Adarsh, you wanna say hi? Hi, yeah, I'm Adarsh. I'm a, a fifth year, fourth year PhD student, fifth year, fifth year PhD student working with Suchi um, on these topics. But he's much wise beyond his age. Um, so let's just dive right in. So I think um, one thing that's been really interesting and I would say a little difficult is, um, you know, three, four, five, six years ago, machine learning uh, researchers, that community was actually a pretty small community, which meant it was extremely easy for, you know, as a field, we progress really fast as new ideas come to light. We come up with ideas for fixing it. And uh, we were able to get by by communicating amongst ourselves really, really fast. And one thing that's changed now in the last four to five years is as uh, the fields expanded dramatically, and most importantly, as the application of machine learning is moving across many, many domains, education, healthcare, uh, criminal reform, transportation, and areas that have very practical relevance in our life. It's not just about the technical aspects of building machine learning models and improving model training. We have to now start thinking a lot more seriously about you know, the downstream consequences of our models as we deploy them and thinking about how model training impacts uh, you know, how uh, reliably the model behaves, whether it behaves in unanticipated ways, whether it leads to failure modes that can have very dramatically bad consequences. And that's and um, that's really what's, uh, you know, that's motivating this whole line of research in machine learning, which is uh, how do we improve model reliability and reliability of machine learning pipelines overall? And so just to start off as a little imagery, I think in the last, uh, as uh, you know, I feel like when uh, we go to go meetings outside of machine learning, there's just so much excitement for the field. And a, a lot of uh, what I feel uh, practitioners their point of view is machine learning is the electricity, right? AI is the new electricity, uh, as people call it, and that it's going to transform every industry, every sector, and it's you know it's this beautiful, elegant bridge that's just going to work. Except as I, as someone who participates in the making of it, and the building of it, and the development of it, as researchers, we know that there are just so many nooks and crannies you have to navigate in order to be able to build something that truly works. Um, and part of it has to do with the shift in historically what was entirely on evaluating performance using AUCs on one to two fixed data sets. Um, but now going forward, I think as we've moved into real world deployments, there's many more forms of interactions with our models. For example, even something that's brought in a lot of attention in the last couple of years is like, you know, once we have a data set, we can build a model and we can make all sorts of claims. But if you, you know, but should that model have even been built to begin with? Or that you're making a claim with your model that can help you do this and that, like help you do amazing recruiting, but actually the model claims are completely false. So there's harms from misuse, there's, uh, you know, consequences, more subtle and technical consequences, like as the model moves from your training data set to an, uh, a deployment data set, how does that then impact model performance? And then just more broadly, what are the different error modes as it moves into the real world? And those are all things we have to think a lot harder about. Um, and I'll like give, let me give you like examples even that have surfaced as a starting point. And then there are many, uh, oh, so it seems like you can't see, are you not able to see my slides as I'm progressing? We can see your slides, we can see the screen. Oh, you can. Okay. Cause, uh, others seem to think that you could only see my title slide. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom, people can see my slides, but if you can't see my slide, please write in the chat box and then we'll fix it. It's um, good now. Okay, perfect. Um, so 
the slides will all be posted. So hopefully you'll get a chance to see it if you haven't seen it. But effectively, just very quickly, I went through kind of where the challenges are and now driving into a few examples. So um, this was an example of a study that was done where they looked at um, chest x-ray images. And what they found was they trained a machine learning predictor to identify whether the chest x-ray, the patient from whom the image was taken, whether this patient had pneumonia or not. Pneumonia is a disease or a complication. And what they found was uh, the model worked really, really well when they worked on, you know, and they, they applied it to one hospital. They took the data, they did your standard trained test and the model worked exceptionally well when you looked at the test data. Now, when you went from one hospital to the second hospital and the third hospital, what they found was the model performance deteriorated. And surprisingly, the model performance was fine when you went from the first to the second hospital, but then suddenly on the third hospital, it deteriorated. So that creates this very strange thing, right? Because as developers, do we then, how many data sets do we test on? Do we even believe that a model is working? Like maybe it's working on the first and the second and the third, and is it suddenly going to just misbehave on the fourth? And as editors and reviewers and people who are trying to use these to deploy, it's scary from their standpoint if they can't even understand like when you have guarantees and when you don't. Um, but we will come back to this example. Uh, another example, again, very critical. This is one in LA. This was crime department, police department that was using data to identify where they were going to be, um, to predict which neighborhoods we would see crime. And then based on, uh, you know, and then they would send their troops there and ideally what they found was they were able to catch more criminals. But one of the very bad unintended consequences was that the more they went to certain neighborhoods, the more they were catching crime there, the more data they were collecting in those neighborhoods, the more the naive way of training models kept reinforcing this idea that maybe that's where all the crime is. And so you had sort of this feedback loop. So you had this feedback loop um, that was reinforcing uh, that the model couldn't be robust to. Rodrigo, do we need to pause and take a question? Uh, no, but actually the slide's still on the same one with the X-rays. I don't know if you have changed it already. I did change it. Uh, well, it stayed on, on the X-rays for some reason. Strange. Um, is it different now? No, it's still the same with the X-rays. Um, so that's odd because I'm sharing my screen. Um, how about now? Can you see it now? Well, now we see it, uh, so it's not full screen, but we can see everything. So maybe we can stay as that. Yeah, that sounds like a good practical plan. Um, I can just expand it. Um, Is there a way to expand fit in window maybe? Yep, there you go. All right, so this is the slide I was on. I was talking about predictive policing um, and talking about um, essentially how um, effectively by using um, machine learning to predict where the crime was, they were sending troops there to collect more data. The more data we were collecting in certain neighborhoods with, where we were discovering crimes, the more that data was now being used for learning and updating our learning algorithm. And it was reinforcing this bias that crimes exist in these neighborhoods where they're policing more. Does that make sense? Here's a third example. This is a very popular example people have spoken about where on the x-axis here in this image, there's a panda, you know, the machine learning method performs really well in uh, identifying this as a panda. We add a little bit of noise to this a specific way and out comes a new image, which to humans, it's imperceptible. It looks like the original image and we would say, of course, this is a panda, but for a machine, uh, again, there are ways in which if the machine is not trained correctly, um, and if the uh, model is uh, like um, the model is sensitive to these kinds of what I call model blind spots, you can end up in the situation where the model thinks this is actually a gibbon and not a panda. And again, another example of like behaving in unexpected ways. A um, couple more examples. So here's an example where 
This is actually a really interesting practical example with lots and lots of uh, applications. So this is in, you know, this is data we were looking on, at in a hospital where we're looking to look at, um, you know, the labs data and the vitals data and all kinds of data that are collected on patients to be able to predict whether the patient will be at risk for a particular complication. And turns out over time, as clinical guidelines change, physicians tend to practice differently. And so in this one very specific example, there was a national guideline that changed. And as that guideline changed, people started changing the ordering pattern. And as you change your ordering pattern, your model's performance completely drifted and deteriorated. So there's a, you know, a machine learning diagnostic model that you think was performing really, really well as the ordering pattern changed. It started missing patients altogether, which is, can be very dangerous. Um, two more quick examples. So this is one where, uh, um, you know, where face detection, face recognition, this is being used everywhere in practical examples and surveillance at airports, on the internet, in all sorts of com commerce, e-commerce retail applications where, um, you know, using images like on Facebook, you automatically identify whether the case, uh, whether the person is uh, a human or not. and um, and Essentially, this paper showed that there was a um, very big discrepancy in performance of our uh, state-of-the-art face recognition algorithms on blacks versus white and females versus males. Again, all scenarios where you know, we have great intentions when we are developing these models, testing and evaluating these models, but historically, our need for testing, de developing and evaluating were entirely based on, you know, I have one or two data sets, I can show you performance, but now we have to be far more comprehensive. And you have to think much harder about, uh, you know, where the, the lack of performance or variability or inconsistency in performance can hurt, um, um, can hurt um, the downstream application and lead to harmful societal impacts. Last example, which is um, one that was, I think, very, uh, quite nonsensical and ridiculous. There was uh, a application where people claimed that you could take an image of a person's face and from that guess what their career it is that they would be suited to. So are you a high IQ person or a low IQ person? And therefore, you know, are you going to be a researcher versus a professional poker player versus a terrorist? And as you can imagine, there are enormous consequences here in terms of what the issues are. So first of all, imagine if you had a bad and poorly trained algorithm and you were using it for recruiting to rule out candidates, that would be terrible. But second of all, more fundamentally, this is an example of an algorithm where uh, you, all it's learning is associations from data. It's just trying to mimic today what types of people look like that hold a certain job. And as you, we well know, there's so much bias in recruiting and so much bias on who gets selected for what job, but also who ends up going to which job, right? Like there's, um, and so effectively what it would be doing is learning the bias that exists today and just kind of reinforcing it, right? So to put it all in one big framework, I gave you six, seven examples, but at a high level, very often these issues and errors kind of fall into these four-ish categories. So the first one is like bad or inadequate data. So you're just answering questions that cannot be answered reliably using the data we have access to today. And so the, fa the face, uh, the, the example we talked about with faceception um, and the example we talked about with face recognition where you don't have an adequate sampling of uh, blacks and black females in your data set will lead you to scenarios where your model itself can't be high quality. Now you can fix that by trying to change your data. You can try to fix that by changing the question you're asking, because maybe you're asking a question that's not feasible to answer, but that's sort of one category. And a lot of egregious examples fall into that first category. Now the second category is model training mm -hmm. associated. So this is an example where the model you're learning is just misspecified. You're learning the, you have the right question, but you're learning the wrong model. Like you need um, different objective functions that are more robust to certain kind of perturbations, or your learning algorithm itself, or your training, your optimization procedure itself is going to lead to local optima where there will be blind spots. And so 
Uh, that's more technical. It's more nuanced. I think in a variety of different model scenarios, we're learning about when they work well and don't work well, and then what are ways in which we can regularize to improve quality of these models. The third type is very subtle, happens all the time, and one I gave you an example of, which is where you're, the algorithm is working great in that pneumonia example, the chest x-ray image, it works great, one hospital, second hospital, turns out when you went to the third hospital, um, you just had um, a different equipment. Or in the example I gave you where we were trying to predict um, this complication and physicians changed their ordering practice pattern. Um, or the example of predictive policing. Basically, you're, one way or the other, the environment or the input data are shifting and that's leading your model. And if you don't train models that are robust to these, you'll end up in situations where the model behaves in ways you don't expect it to. Uh, and this issue is pervasive. The fourth and last example is kind of more what I would consider the, in, um, the um, kind of intersection of like model machine learning, but really also machine learning and um, communication, like how we describe and summarize what are our models actually learning so that the end users don't end up uh, extrapolating more than it is or end up misusing it. Um, and so this has uh, notions of, you know, uh, can we come up with like report cards, right? Like cards for summarizing model performance. When does the model perform well and not perform well? Which is really, um, and the interesting things that are parallel from all sorts of other fields where we can learn things. So very often when we're building machine learning um, uh, models and we're deploying them, we're really trying to impact some real world thing. Like our, the goal of our models is to influence some kind of behavior, right? You're getting people to um, change the way they're making some decisions or you're getting them to, uh, you know, maybe uh, order some things that they weren't ordering or diagnose patients differently or change the way we're doing policing or change the way we're mm -hmm. determining, you know, who should or shouldn't be, um, you know, get, um, extra attention uh, when we're talking about, uh, um, you know, uh, policing, uh, sorry, criminal justice and, um, and uh, analyzing cases of victims. So what I'm talking about here is like in any one of these scenarios in other fields, like in medicine, there's been a huge history of studying algorithms and running trials and prospective trials where we think about you know, performance and efficacy. And we think about efficacy in the context of an application and an end use case. And we need to be thinking about our algorithms and our pipelines in the same way. How do we measure efficacy of these solution sets as we deploy them? The second area where I think there's a lot of uh, ideas for us to learn from is civil engineering um, and um, um, like nuclear engineering, where effectively, you know, the consequences of getting things wrong are very, very high. So they have a huge, very mature framework around this notion of reliability and how do you engineer for reliability and what are principles to adopt and frameworks for being able to engineer for reliability. So based on that, I'm kind of extracting at a very high level, I think, you know, what this means for machine learning. And then I will take a piece of it today and then we'll drive deeper into that, which is, so three key areas. First is how do we even become more proactive rather than reactive? So proactive means when we're going to build and deploy a system, a learning algorithm to support an application, can we more proactively think about failure modes? Can we build learning algorithms that are uh, less, you know, that are more robust to these against these failure modes? Uh, so here it's all about moving from our current methods of learning to what moving to what I would call, you know, reliable learning or robust learning methods where the resulting models that we're getting are just more failure proofed. Um, and thinking about, you know, and, and much of today's talk will, and today and the rest of the tutorial will focus on that. But just to cover briefly, there are other aspects of it. So it's not just about build your learning algorithm, make it very accurate, and then stop there. The reality is if you're gonna build it and deploy it, something in the world is gonna shift and change. Maybe you, you were able to learn and you tried the hardest you could, but in the real world, issues will come up. So that leads into the second bullet point, which is how do we 
monitor these on the fly? Like how do we detect likely mistakes? Can we identify when something is becoming unstable and needs to be retrained? Can we identify when something isn't working well? And then third is how do we now go from identifying when things aren't working well and ways to detect this to this notion of maintenance, right? And maintenance sounds like a boring word, but really it's what we call some notion of like continual learning, but continual not in the sense that we have to be learning continuously every second, but more as a version of as we get more data, as we learn about more complex populations, as there are drifts in, uh, drifts in the environment, how do we adapt? How do we adapt the, um, the resulting models to these scenarios? So that's sort of roughly like three key areas, borrowing principles from reliability engineering, where from other fields where if we were to think in this way, um, you know, there's enormous opportunity for work in each of these bucket areas. And um, in 2019, we gave a little tutorial on this and we dive into each of these three areas in much more detail. Um, obviously, it's very expansive, but uh, so there's only so much justice we could do. But for today, we'll actually focus on only the first, which is uh, there's been an enormous amount of progress in the last few years in terms of thinking about um, how do we um, build models that are robust. And so that will be what we'll focus on for the remainder of the two hours and 40 minutes. Um, I'll pause if there are any questions. Now is a good time. I'll take a 30 second break and otherwise move to the next uh, topic. So we, so, um, so we started with this x-ray example I'd given, right? And we said, look, we can use x-rays to diagnose pneumonia. And this notion that it worked very well in one or two hospitals and then it suddenly did really well, but poorly when, it, when we went to a different site. So the question is why, why did that happen? So it's really important to understand the why in these scenarios in order to understand what can we do to fix it. So here's the example. Turns out in this example, the issue was that there were different scanning protocols being used. And because the scanning protocols were different, there was information here that tells you whether it's the front or the back of the uh, chest. But in addition to the front and back of the chest, there was additional information around the type of... Uh, scanner that was being used and the scanning protocol. And when you move from one hospital to another, the scanning protocols were a little bit different. And what it was doing was memorizing information in terms of the scanning protocol. And there was information leak in terms of the scanning protocol in the first couple of hospitals that helped boost performance. But when you move to the third site, because the protocols were totally different, that same information that was helping you in the first couple of hospitals hurt you in the later hospitals. And so there are myriad examples of this where, you know, if you, you know, like if you're able to memorize something in the environment you're working in, perhaps you memorize some behavior like, you know, before this patient ends up getting this uh, health condition, physicians actually often go ahead and write a note of this particular form. And then you use the fact that they wrote the note of this particular form to diagnose the patient. Well, that's not very helpful in practice because they wrote the note because they diagnosed the person, but your machine learning model doesn't know any better. So there are all sorts of ways in which there's leakage that happens. And, um, and that was the issue. So the question is, you know, could this have been prevented? So given a data set, we learn a particular association between pneumonia and style protocols, and this doesn't generalize. And so, the question is, what do we do? So can we just take that image and take a patch of that image where this information is, just take it out. And then, you know, it's like a hack. I'll take the image, I take it out. And then maybe I just learn on that. That's actually pretty good. It would do better than the original so solution. The only challenge is there is some useful information here we do need. So we do need this information about whether it's the front or the back of the image, um, but we don't need sort of all the other details. And so the question is, could we do any better? Same thing in the predictive policing example. Um, as things change, another example of data set shift. So these are examples of data set shift where the question is, could we now learn models that could actually be, would allow us to be robust to these kinds of scenarios? And that's the question we will answer. So these examples are different forms of shifts. Can we learn models that are stable to shifts? There's a large literature now in the last few years, especially on tackling shifts. And so we'll talk about 
what those are, some example ways to approach it. Uh, and today I'll start with um, sort of one example way to approach it. So historically in machine learning, when we saw scenarios like this, where we have one data set, we use the data set, we split it into train and test, we train using the train data, and then we evaluate performance on the test data. Great. And now when we think there's been a shift, that means we have a new data set that's a little different from the first data set, what do we do? Some form of transfer learning, which historically has been in the following form. Like I'm giving you on the right some examples, various different ways in which people have attempted it. But basically, you're going to use some samples from this target environment, and then you're going to retune your model to this target environment. And the retuning can be uh, different forms of clever. So you can do um, importance weighting for covariate shifts, some kind of kernel matching approach. I mean, there are myriad such approaches, but all they're like in an intuitively in a nutshell, what they're doing is I have data set one. Now, where I've learned my model, I have a new data set in a slightly new, just different and perturbed environment. I'm going to use that somehow to retune my model. And one of the challenges that occur now is that it may be good at that second environment, but you don't really know, is it going to be good at the third environment? Is it going to be good at the fourth environment? The other thing is, um, you know, if, um, if you're in a safety critical setting where making mistakes is very costly, like you could kill people, then this idea of like, um, you know, waiting to be, you, you, you really be uh, failure proofed ahead of time, which is you want to know what kinds of differences can occur and um, be proactively preventing failures against them as opposed to after the fact where you've collected a bunch of data and now you're seeing, oh, I've collected a bunch of data, I'm going to retune your model to that data and now it's applicable on this new data, right? So in very fast changing environments, it's very, it's very difficult to apply this kind of technique where you're continuously waiting for new data to come in for you to be good on that data in order to be able to use in that environment at all together. So instead, we're going to do this notion of, um, so like I said, challenge here is you would need data from all possible test environments, which is very unrealistic to obtain. Uh, we th I kind of think intuitively of these methods as reactive. They're, you're, you're kind of fix the errors once you already see them. Um, and what we really want is some kind of guarantee up front, uh, which is we want models that generalize to new unseen environments without needing to do massive amounts of data from them. And so shifting gears, that's sort of what this whole line of approach is about, which is data from target environments are not needed. Uh, use, we want to use alternative ways to specify desirable forms of robustness and then use learning methods that can guarantee us that form of robustness. And so the benefits of this is obviously that performance of resulting models are less likely to deteriorate in unanticipated ways. They're more amenable to generalizing when we move from one environment to another and it very much takes this failure prevention avoidance perspective, which is absolutely critical for safety, critical applications. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you the overall, like what will you learn from this 3R tutorial and the key bullet points you will take away with after you listen to me and others talk to you today, tomorrow, and day after. Um, and so first thing we'll start with is, this question will help you answer, can we develop learning methods that are robust to shifts? That is, can we build these new classes of models that are called shift-stable models? Um, we'll walk you through one example algorithm today. That's a shift-stable algorithm. We'll talk through how we learn it from data, talk about what kind of guarantees we give as an example, and turns out causality has a huge role to play in developing these kinds of algorithms. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll shift gears from instead of talking about one algorithm and one end-to-end -end pipeline, we'll expand to start thinking about more broadly, how do we, like what are the different classes of algorithms or approaches people are taking to develop uh, reliable and robust models? And like, to what extent do these different types of approaches people are giving us, what kinds of guarantees are they giving us, right? Like you have different classes of models, there's naturally a stability accuracy trade-off where if you want models that are stable, in some scenarios, they're less accurate. Um, there's obviously a stability accuracy optimal frontier 
but different ways, different approaches are looking for different kinds of guarantees, like worst case performance versus average case performance. And so we'll overview this notion of stability accuracy trade-off. We'll talk about different approaches and then we'll compare and contrast them in terms of what is it that they're prioritizing? What kind of guarantees are they prioritizing? And so by the end of it, you should come out of it with not just one algorithm, but somewhat of an overview for landscape and different ways in which people are approaching it, but also where we think current gaps are in the field and where there's opportunity to develop new ideas. All right, I hope you're as jazzed to listen uh, about this next place as I am. So let's start with one example of like a deep dive of a stable algorithm creating shift stable models. So in order to do this, here are kind of the four pieces to it. So the first piece is you wanna go into a domain, you're gonna start building a model, you're the expert, and you wanna think about, well, what are the problematic shifts? Like in the pneumonia example, there was a shift, right? The policing example. So what are the problematic shifts that I'm worried about? It's like you're building a bridge. You wanna think about what are the failure modes? Like, is there gonna be a storm? Do you need to protect against that? Is there, are there a lot of earthquakes? You need to protect against that. So depending on what your use case is, you're gonna have a notion of what failure modes are both likely to occur and it's important that we be robust to them. So that's the first piece, which is identify likely problematic shifts and specify which shifts to protect from. Then we go into uh, describing a learning algorithm that once you specify it, allows you to learn models that are robust to them or will tell you such a model doesn't exist and you have to do some kind of trade-off. And then finally, we'll cover for this one example, what kind of optimality and soundness completeness uh, guarantee do we get as a way to see one end to end, okay? So um, with, for this particular example, I wanna give you one practical um, empirical result, just to kind of, for those of you who are not super familiar with the literature, hopefully this motivates uh, you know and helps understanding like why should you care so in this example very very simple uh what we did was um you know these are two different classes of stable models like i said there are many different learning algorithms that result in different classes of stable algorithms that um you know different varying degrees to which they are both accurate and stable these are two algorithms that have the same kind of stability but this happens to be uh, more accurate than this one. And here in this case on the y-axis, I'm showing you error. And I'm showing you error, measured error on a test set. So we took, we trained it on one scenario and now we're evaluating it in a test set. And we've, on the x-axis, varied the test set environment quite a bit. So we're taking the coefficients. So in this case, the model is super simple. We're trying to predict T, you have two input variables A and C. And the part that's shifting here is the, is the A variable, the distribution of A is changing across these different test environments. And what you see is when the train and test environments are very, very similar, the three models, this is sort of what you would do a naive regression model, like a classic supervised learning method without any notions of robustness, how this model performs versus the stable models perform. And what you, what you see is like, you know, as you would expect, this performs like classical learning performs really well when train and test environments are the same. And um, as you deviate away from these environments and you get, you know, um, test environments that are very different from your training environments, if you go on either side, you can see performance now starts to deteriorate and errors start to increase. On the other hand, the thing that's interesting about the stable algorithms is, yes, they try two different of, um, State stability trade-off, stability accuracy trade-off, uh, but the stable algorithms, the performance doesn't, you expect it to be invariant to this change in distribution, and it indeed is, right? So as the test environment changes, the model performance doesn't vary and behave in unanticipated ways, or doesn't deteriorate. It's consistent, as you would expect. Make sense? So, that's the simulated data example. Here's the practical application of this in our diagnosis example that previously brought up. So here in this case, you have a graph of people placing orders of tests, uh, di uh, di um, lab tests and vitals, and we're using all that to diagnose. And this is a real practical data set. And 
as we saw differences in physician behavior and ordering patterns, this is an unstable model, two different types of stable models, um, but how their performance vary with these ordering patterns. And again, very, very scary if like your precision is varying so widely, uh, you know, with small changes in your data set. In this, uh, to close this example, here what I'm showing is basically if the, if the model was indeed stable, robust, and you could give guarantees that it was actually um, uh, invariant to provide a practice patterns, and it was invariant to the way physicians order, and that won't impact model performance within some reasonable bounds, then what we're seeing here is something really cool, which is... Um, a, you know, a reliable learning method would actually put you in a scenario where um, you have two data sets here, regime A, regime B, two different regimes in which something was trained, a naive method trained in regime A as the ordering pattern changes, we're showing a couple of different scores here. So what we're showing is first thing is the prediction, the concordance between the prediction if a model was trained on regime B and tested on regime B versus trained on regime A and tested on regime B, actually deteriorates like you would expect the models to be consistent but it becomes inconsistent when it's naive and the AUC which is the performance also deteriorates on the other hand if the model was trained in a way that it's expected to be robust to training uh, ordering patterns you actually see that not only is the performance across training in the two uh, training and testing in the two regimes very consistent as you would expect but also performance doesn't deteriorate um, I went through this super high level, but just some exam, practical examples and some pointers to papers, which you can go through again in your own time later. And, you know, we'll drive into more technical details as we go through it through the rest of the tutorial. Okay. So now that we've seen a few examples, let's walk through uh, an actual procedure for making this happen. So the first piece is we need to identify likely problematic shifts. Now, in order to identify likely problematic shifts, I'm going to use this example. Um, is it very noisy near me? Because there's some construction going on. Can you still hear me fine? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so in this example, um, first thing we have to do, the very first thing is, can we somehow start reasoning about what is the data? What are the variables in the data set? And can we represent it and start thinking about what shifts occur, right? So in this example, I'm going to take the sepsis example that I um, started with. So in this case, the variables are D is for demographics like age and gender. This is a simple graph. Um, S is for whether or not you have the particular condition, sepsis or not. O is whether you're ordering a particular like lab or a particular vital sign. So in this case, it's just about whether I'm going to like vitals, like blood pressure, heart rate are measured all the time, but certain lab tests like white blood cell count is only measured occasionally. So what O is saying is, am I going to order that variable? Am I going to order the test? And then if it's ordered, L tells you what the value of the test is. And then V tells you what the value of the, um, the vitals are. So to quickly summarize, in this example, you have a person, age, gender, obviously given your age, gender, your demographic, race, et cetera, it has an impact on your likelihood of having this disease. So that's what this arrow represents. Given whether you, I believe you have the disease or not and what your predisposition is, I may or may not choose to order the test. So this is what this O variable dependency is doing. And then once I order, you know, depending on whether you have sepsis or not, what your predisposition is, I'm going to see your lab results. And then similarly, given whether you have sepsis or not and your predisposition, it's going to impact what your vitals look like, right? Very simple. Uh, it's not simple if you're not used to reasoning in graphical language. Um, so fear not. Um, later, I give you a little take-home exercise related to it. But intuitively, conceptually, what it's allowing you to do is to reason about what are the variables in your graph, like what are the variables that you, are, you have data on, what, um, how do they relate to each other? And then most importantly in red, which parts of the graph can be changing or what parts of your domain can be changing over time? So in this example that I gave, turns out over time, this arrow that I've marked in red is what's shifting or changing. Like these stay the same, that's part of basic biology. But in this case, uh, you know, the guideline change when physicians choose to order certain tests. 
So in regime one, they were ordering it very infrequently. In regime two, they're ordering it very frequently. And so this is the, the variable, uh, the dependency in your graph that's changing. And because that's changing, you really want to think about learning a model that's going to be robust to changes in this dependency. Okay. So what this graphical language does very nicely, it makes it possible to represent the reason about stable and unstable distribution and, shift, and identify shifts we want to be able to robust to. So I'm going to push this idea a little bit further. So in this example, um, this is a case of smoking, not smoking, like in cancer. Just to do a few such examples to get a sense for how graphs can be used to represent shifts. So I want to look at smoking habits now and predict whether you'll have cancer or not. And in two years, actually two years. Uh, and so effectively, um, this is the graph that says given today, I want to predict C at two. And then let's say there was a smoking ban and now people's smoking habits are changing. Obviously given on they were smoking, is the prevalence of cancer changing? Well, that's biology, that hasn't changed. And so if you wanted to represent that information using this kind of a, a graph, what it's just saying is X is your input variable. You're trying to predict T, which is whether you have cancer or not, given X, which is your smoking habit. And the distribution T given X is stable, right? Like how, whether or not you're going to get cancer given you smoke, that's biology, that's not changing. On the other hand, X is changing because now that there was a smoking ban, the number of people who are smoking, that shifts. And who's choosing to smoke is shifting. Another example like uh, of what's called... Um, so in the same example, we're going to use this notion of an S variable here. So in order to specify the unstable distribution, we basically take all the variables, like wherever there's a shift and kind of use S to, S to point at that shift or uh, at, point at the distribution that is shifting. Um, I, that was covariate shift, very common example here. There's label shift. So label shift is one where basically rather than the distribution of X, the distribution of T is changing. Um, and then going back to our pneumonia example, here you have a simple four-part graph. T is your target diagnosis, whether you have pneumonia or not. D is the department where the image was taken. F is the style features on the scanner. And X is what was the image produced, right? So the lung x-ray image. And in this example, um, let's walk through it. What is stable and unstable? So given that you have given that you have pneumonia and given that you're using a particular scanner, we have a distribution of what the images look like, right? Because pneumonia shows up a certain way in a chest X-ray image. So this distribution is just biology, it's stable. We don't expect this to change in this example. It's possible, you know, humans evolve, biology evolves, and it changes at the time scale of a hundred years, but not in the particular scenario that we're interacting with. In this example, we've also assumed Given the department, these hospitals are very nearby, so the prevalence of pneumonia across them actually is pretty similar. So that doesn't change. On the other hand, as we identified, which scanner you use, and therefore the imaging protocols you use do actually vary by department. So this particular arrow is changing. This part is unstable, these are stable. And so now that you have an image like this, you can say what was your, your goal was to try to fig figure out how to predict T, which is whether or not the patient has pneumonia, given x and your goal is going to be can i do t given x such that it actually doesn't learn any of this unstable information so you know using this language of graphs and selection diagrams what it means is i'm going to take this graph d in this case is um you know this is the graph like i showed you in this case let's even imagine d was missing and unobserved it doesn't matter but most importantly here, I've put an S variable, which is a selection variable that's pointing into F because the distribution of F is changing given D, right? So this allows me to specify where is the shift happening, okay? And you can do this in very complicated graphs. If, um, you know, we've done this in a lot of really, like, it's just a way to be able to have a conversation about your domain. Even if you don't actually end up using your graph in any formal way, just having some way to represent your data allows you to reason about this notion of shifts, what shifts can occur, what dependencies are in your data. And, and there's just virtually no way to guarantee robustness without being able to think about where the failure modes might be. So with that in mind, take home exercise. 
there are numerous tutorials on the internet on directed acyclic graphs. In fact, in machine learning, uh, we spend almost a decade spending a lot of energy developing our understanding of graphs, learning graphs. You'll see other tutorials as part of SMILES that are all about structured learning of graphs from data. If you don't know the graph, you can learn the graph from data. We'll actually talk later about an example where we learn the graph from data automatically, and then we consume that graph to, in order to start reasoning about failure modes and shifts. But all in all, it'll be a very wise investment for you to go learn about DAGs and representing data using DAGs and just do a couple of exercises of taking a domain and trying to think about it. So now let's imagine you have some graph, you were able to understand what are the things that would shift. Now we need to specify which shifts to protect from. So in the pneumonia example, we only have one big shift we are worried about in this case, we've decided we wanna protect from it. That's it, simple. What this gives you is the ability to now talk to your domain experts and have this conversation, which is, you know, there are six things that can change. Do we really need to worry about all of them? Because if you worry about all of them, as you will later learn, the more conservative you are, the more shift invariant you want to be, obviously your model, it turns out your model is also going to be less accurate because there are things in the data it could learn, it could memorize, but it's choosing not to memorize so that it could be shift invariant. But that means then you're compromising a performance on this data set, right? So that's effectively the conversation you're having in terms of, um, in terms of like which shifts you want to protect from. Now it turns out, now that you have such a graph, you can actually obtain a resulting model that is um, um, like actually invariant to these shifts. So you, the form looks something like this, um, which is you get a graph, you identify which specs, which S variables here you want to control for, remove the ones you don't want to control for, and then uh, we're, um, there's, um, this is an example algorithm. I'll talk about guarantees of this algorithm. For now, we'll call it the surgery estimator. What it does is given the graph and given the invariant specs and which invariances you care to learn, what it outputs is a model that is robust to shifts in these variables you did specify you want to be invariant here. Okay, so what does the model output look like? So turns out the model output is of this following form. Effectively, it's intuitively taking this graph, it's um, learning a model um, which has implicitly the following form. Like it's a collection, it's, it's taking this and in graphical form, you can think of it as just learning parts of the distribution. So rather than learning the entire joint, it only learns parts of the graph. And the parts that it chooses to learn are the parts which have black edges, which means they are stable across data sets. And the parts that it wants to forget or not learn are the parts where there are red edges, right? It makes intuitive sense. If something isn't gonna generalize, I don't wanna learn it. If something is gonna generalize, I want to learn it. And then in the mod, um, so I'm giving you an intuitive description. That's not how the mathematics of it works, but intuitively that's what it's doing. And the output of it looks like a collection of conditionals that are tied together in order to give the model output because the conditionals are each learning parts of the graph that do generalize. And uh, just for the purpose of completing this example, you know, so it'll give you a model output, parts of the graph that do generalize, and then how you combine them in order to get your predictor. Uh, the learning method takes care of all that. And then from a fitting perspective, one natural question people have is, oh, if I do this, does that mean I can't use deep learning? Like I can't use DNNs or RNNs or my favorite model. Like am I constrained in the choice of models I use because I'm, you know, writing down these conditionals? And turns out you can just train, like you can use any of your favorite models in order to train these conditionals. So for instance, just like you would do model fitting in any other way, if T given A, B, C, D is temporal data with a lot of missingness, you might want to use an RNN for it. Um, if A given C comma D is a logistic, then use a simple logistic link function. But effectively, the idea is the, the, to get this robust model, it's a collection of submodels that are stitched together and the collection of individual submodels are each, you have the flexibility to train them as you'd like and use standard model selection procedures for evaluating quality. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell how the procedure would work.
I'm actually going to give you um, a, a Adarsh, in fact, is going to walk you through a little bit more detail. But before we do that, I just want to, uh, for those of you who are curious on the how, but let me just uh, finish it all the way through and talk through the guarantees first, which is, all right, let's trust. We have this graph. We have the invariant spec. We have the learning algorithm. It's very flexible. It can learn uh, and uh, gives you some kind of robust output, like a stable model. So what can I say about the quality of this model? Is it optimal? Is it just learning random stable parts of the graph? Or is it learning, the, you know, is it as optimal as it, is it optimal? And from an accuracy standpoint, um, what is it from a soundness completeness perspective? Like what happens? Can it always learn a stable algorithm? So let's go through that. So the first one intuitively explained is this idea that condition on the shifts you want to impose, right? So you basically said, I want it to be robust to certain kinds of shifts. Given that you want it to be robust to certain kinds of shifts, think of it as creating, this is not, intu this is not what's happening behind the hood, but intuitively, this is sort of how to think about it, which is intuitively, think of it as creating thousands of data sets where the variables that you said you wanted to be robust to, think of it as having an adversary. This adversary's job is to make you fail or lose. So what they're doing is taking the variables where you want it, you, you want it to be robust to those shifts. They're going to take those variables and uh, make them uh, randomly generate those variables to be as far away from the training distribution as possible. And they're generating them in a way to hurt you to the extent possible, right? So you as the learner, you want to learn a graph so that even if I had an adversary that tried to shift these distributions uh, to whatever extent, I am going to still have a resulting model that whose performance is going to be is is going to be invariant to those shifts or is not going to deteriorate as shifts occur. And so the first result here is that basically it gives you this optimal stable predictor uh, or optimal stable estimator in the class of all possible estimators where you could arbitrarily shift these S variables we identified and among the class of all part of, uh, among the class of models that are going to be invariant to those arbitrary shifts, you're going to learn the model that is most performant. Okay. That was a bit of a handful, but intuitively what it says is if you want to guarantee robustness, it's the most optimal thing you can learn in the class of models that guarantee robustness to arbitrary shifts to those S variables you specified. Okay. So that's good news. So um, that's, uh, now the question is, does it always work? So the procedure is sound, which is when it does give you an output, it does return you a model or an estimator, that estimator is indeed going to be invariant to anticipated shifts. However, there will be scenarios where it's gonna give you an answer which is not possible. Um, and in that case, you can also have this guarantee that if the procedure is complete, which is if it fails, then no estimable uh, invariant distribution exists. There isn't an alternative procedure that's going to get you there that has the same kind of guarantees. So that's good. It's both sound and complete. And then in the class, uh, that's if it's possible to estimate, it gives you optimal. Now, one trick here is that um, in terms of practically applying these ideas, um, you know, obviously, in order to be able to use this, there are certain good practices we'll have to adopt as machine learning model developers and researchers, which is first, you have to do things like understand the data, understand the domain, understand what the risks might be. Um, now, some people get very anxious because they say, well, this thing looks like it needs a graph. Uh, what if I don't know the graph with some certainty? And, and turns out the graph that I used was a variant of a causal graph. Um, and so, so they might say, well, what if I don't know the DAG? Isn't the R and DAGs really hard to learn? Can I, can I still use it? And so it turns out you can, and we'll talk about some of this um, in our later sessions tomorrow and day after. Um, but um, yeah, it's absolutely possible. Now, the other thing is, what if it turns out that it, what it returns to me is says, um, there isn't a stable distribution that's possible to build. Well, there are other forms of stability. At that point, what you can do is start to reason. Well, do I need all of this? Maybe I can compromise in some places. Maybe I can impose different kinds of robustness because what we tried to do was worst case, which is our adversary can 
arbitrarily move the distribution for the variables that we were worried about protecting uh, our shifts from. But there are other scenarios where instead of doing arbitrary, you could say, well, I want to be robust to a little ball around that. You know, they can change the variable, but not arbitrarily, just a little bit. So can I, can I, deal, with, uh, can I deal with that scenario? And so those are some of the example things we'll talk about in the following session. So to recap, I covered why stability and understanding model robustness is so important. Again, as I hope as uh, responsible developers, researchers, and practitioners, uh, this is, I hope I've convinced you that this is critical to care about with some of the examples we gave. We walked through an end-to-end -end example pipeline where we talked about what are the sh likely shifts in a domain? How do you specify these shifts? An example learning algorithm that gives you something that is robust. We talked about guarantees on this. Um, and then, you know, we'll continue this. But before I leave, I still have a couple minutes. Um, so I did a lot of the presentation today. Adarsh is going to do more of the presentation for tomorrow. But Adarsh, do you want to walk through the mechanics of the surgery estimator for the people who are very curious about why it works in a couple of minutes? Yeah, um, just to sort of peer a little bit under the hood of, of what's going on. Um, and, and how you go from taking this graph and this data and outputting something that satisfies um, the guarantees that Suchi was just talking about. Um, so kind of to recall the, the setup for what, uh, what's going on here, as an input, you're taking this graph where we have these pieces, these S variables that are telling us um, the, the shifts that we want to protect against, what we're worried about um, shifting. So this is a, this is a simple graph. Um, we're predicting T and the variables we're observing are X and F. And so what this graph is telling us, as far as an invariant specification goes, is it's telling us that we want to be invariant to the way in which F is generated. Um, so this is like invariance to the style features that um, we were talking about in the example. So in terms of what, um, what the algorithm is actually doing, um, and so there are algorithms for doing this, we don't have to do this manually, but um, essentially what it's doing is it's using the graph and looking at the corresponding factorization of the joint distribution. And it's saying which of these pieces um, correspond to the shifts that we're worried about. So which of these pieces are unstable, these unstable factors which um, um, can, can vary and are affected by the shifts. And what we want to attempt to do is to delete these factors and retain the other factors which correspond to um, stable information about the distribution that we can use to predict. And so, um, when you do so and you delete those factors, you, you end up with the distribution. So here um, at the top, we have the, the factorization of the graph. Um, when you delete that factor and simplify, um, you get um, the distribution below, which if you look has only these two factors um, where S is not involved in it. And so that means that these two factors are stable um, to the types of shifts that um, we specified we were worried about. And, um, <laughs> And other, just to make the tie to causal causality a very explicit, um, is effectively this is almost like the resulting operator is like taking the original joint and then you do, you're doing a do operation on these variables where you have s pointing to them. So in this case, it was like doing a you know it's like a do uh, uh, operation on f. Well, uh, thanks again um, for having me. So this is part two of a three-part uh, discussion on increasing uh, on causality and increasing model reliability in machine learning. Yesterday, um, we spoke, you know, we spent the early part of yesterday's talk kind of motivating why, uh, you know, with examples, um, errors that arise as we're starting to move from, you know, just thinking of our models as like what we evaluate using one or two fixed data sets to putting it actually in the real world. And um, I discussed um, several examples, kind of categorize these kinds of errors into four key buckets. We spoke about one very big type of error, which is currently um, uh, in, you know, something there's an, it's an emerging area, exciting area around uh, stability, the idea of building models that are stable to environments or across environments, especially important as we move from uh, a development data set to a uh, validation data set or to new environments as we deploy. Um, and in that um, area, we kind of started by talking about one example, uh, example algorithm just to motivate the idea of how stability works and how do we learn these kinds of stable algorithms for data. And if so, what kind of uh, guarantees can we get? Um, 
So if you are coming into this particular part of the tutorial and you haven't seen the first uh, part, I strongly recommend you do that because there's a lot of language and context we set up that we will reuse today. And then today, uh, my hope is we're going to continue that thread. So we spoke about one algorithm end to end. We spoke about the theory. We spoke about some I, in, empirical examples. So today we're going to broaden our scope. Instead of we're going to think about what are the different ways in which we're pro, uh, the field is approaching stability. What are the different frameworks? And then what are the pros and cons of these different frameworks? And then we're going to continue this thought into if we want to be able to get guarantees, how do we, um, you know, we're going to build on some of our past work to, uh, to elaborate and explain some more algorithms in detail that have really nice guarantees. And then finally, um, we'll end with this concept of the stability accuracy trade-off today, which is, as we see the plethora of algorithms um, emerging in the field, how do we contrast and compare them? How do we think about, um, you know, like, which one is better and why? Uh, and, and sort of that's where we'll um, end today and then we'll pick up again in part three. With that, let me dive in. So let's see. So if I don't have the thing on the left, I can't exactly see. Um, so I think I'm gonna need the navigator. And Rodrigo, just so you don't get anxious, this is all of the slides including part three. So if you still see slides at the end as we are nearing the hour, I have a natural termination point. Um, okay. So great. So let's continue. So we, we spoke theoretically about results. We spoke empirically about some examples. One running example I was using was this pneumonia example, chest x-ray example. And so I thought I would end by just quickly showing you how we would apply the surgery estimator um, and the um, and the sort of framework we introduced for getting stable distributions here. So in this example, um, again, our um, goal was to try to diagnose given an image. Uh, what is the diagnosis T given um, X? And so in this example, the challenge we ran into was that effectively there were protocol imaging protocol department specific features that are captured in the image that was actually um, introducing leakage and hurting generalization as you went from one side to another. So the thought was, well, how do we fix it? And so here's our graph. We had established that this is the unstable edge. We established sort of an end-to-end -end pipeline. Now in this example, um, turns out like the surgery estimator, when you apply it to this distribution, what it computes is that effectively your resulting model needs to estimate P of X given T comma F P of T, and then you can integrate to obtain P of T given X comma do F. So effectively, uh, very simple terms. I realize I should have added more information to make it more simple, but simply speaking, you're taking this image, you're gonna need to compute this, these particular style features that you absolutely need, uh, which is, um, and, and you need to be able to condition on these. So the style features are um, kind of, um, like whether it's a front or back, what type of, what type of an instrument it is, uh, where the instrument was measured, and you wanna actually explicitly condition on it as opposed to marginalizing. So previously that variable was hidden. So you wanna, uh, you wanna explicitly compute that feature F. And then once you compute the feature F, then the two distributions you're um, fitting are P of X given T comma F, which is a standard, you know, you can use a convolutional neural network or whatever to fit this P of T, and then you, um, and these then get combined in order to produce uh, the answer we care about, which is P of T uh, given D, F, and X. So far, so good. So um, finishing that example, let's actually now go back to the bigger question, which is we said, I started by showing an example of how you're using causality to motivate um, you know, we were using a causal graph, we were using relationships on the graph to motivate this idea of stable and unstable distributions, and then computing an estimator that was actually stable. But is causality the only way to think about improving model reliability and robustness, or are there alternatives? So Adarsh, can you walk us through this and I'll advance the slides as you speak? Yeah, sure. So an alternative framing to, to the causal way that we, um, we spoke about kind of complementary is this idea of 
um, bounded distributional robustness. Um, and so what this means is that um, we get our, we have our data, which comes, our training data, which comes from some training distribution. And we are going to assume that shifts produce uh, test environments, which come from some kind of uncertainty ball that's centered around that training distribution. And so um, typically, you know, one common way to, to characterize this uncertainty ball is using, say, like a finite radius statistical divergence. So an example might be, I'll think about um, test environments which are, uh, have a KL divergence less than rho from my, my training distribution. And what we can do with this kind of formulation is we can consider a specific type of shift. So previously we had talked about covariate shift, um, which was this case in which the, the distribution of the covariates, the distribution of the features X can shift, but this conditional distribution P of Y given X is staying the same. And so we're gonna constrain this class of shifts by saying, um, P of X can uh, P of X can shift to a new distribution Q of X um, subject to its KL divergence from uh, P of X being less than rho. Um, and so to um, to contrast this with the, the the view that we had been talking about before and what Suchi was talking about um, with bounded distributional robustness, we're thinking about a finite magnitude shift. So we're saying that um, the the distribution can be different from uh, can shift from our original distribution, but by some finite amount. And this is different from the arbitrary magnitude shifts we were talking about, where, for example, the, the way that um, the style features for the, the, um, for the pneumonia x-rays are chosen, that can sort of arbitrarily shift, and we're not um, constraining that. And the reason why this distinction is important to make is because particularly in safety critical domains, so for example, healthcare, where these models are interacting and, and have impacts on um, health outcomes for patients, mistakes are costly. And so it, it can be difficult and it's, it's very important to correctly specify um, the bounds for these shifts or, or we want robustness to a large class of shifts. And so in those cases, um, this is uh, bounded distributional robustness may not be uh, appropriate. And we want arbitrary guarantees to arbitrary shifts. Next. So uh, just a question here for you others. Like, so in reality, when people are trying to do this, what they really have access to is a data set they don't even have access to an actual distribution, right? So my assumption is given a data set, you're learning a distribution. In this case, we're calling it, say, this first part B. And so this is a distribution that's cap, you know, being learned from that data set. And presumably we're saying around that distribution, around the data set is where, you know, more in, uh, learned from the data set, we're putting some sort of norm ball deviation. Is that correct? Yep, exactly. We're using the empirical distribution of our sample and taking that as our source distribution. Got it. So this translates, this idea of bounded distributional robustness translates directly nicely into an objective function where we're given data from this distribution P0. And um, what, we're, what we're considering is a ball or is our, this uncertainty ball of distributions Q such that um, uh, Q satisfies what we see in the set that for some statistical divergence, the divergence of Q from that distribution we were given, our training distribution P0, um, that divergence is less than or equal to this radius rho. Um, and so then what we're really doing is we're saying, I wanna minimize my model's parameters theta with respect to the worst case or maximum loss uh, distribution in the set of distributions Q. And so it, it, it has a nice uh, mathematical objective and just to sort of see, see what this looks like in a simple example, um, here's a, a latent mixture model. So we, we've generated um, the variable we're predicting Y from, some, uh, from features X and there's these two populations, a population corresponding to G being one and this is the majority and a population corresponding to G being zero and this is the minority making up 10% um, of, of this distribution. So we're gonna consider a shift in which we're taking this original distribution with this mixture, and we're going to look at a shift where we only see samples from the minority subpopulation. Next. So what this shows is we're, we're looking at um, two things. Uh, in, in both figures, we're looking at the loss. So this is mean squared error, so higher is worse. We're looking at um, the loss of uh, different models. Um, versus on the x-axis, we have the radius of the robustness ball being considered during training. And so uh, plot A is showing the loss on the unshifted distribution. This is um, new data from the, the training distribution. And then 
Uh, plot B, what we're looking at is the performance, the loss on this minority subgroup. So this is that shifted distribution. And so there's a, there's, um, a couple of takeaways that we can get for what bounded distributional robustness is doing. Um, first, what uh, different methods um, correspond, um, the, the different methods, um, as we go across the x-axis, we're increasing the radius, which means that we're increasing this uncertainty set. So we're considering um, larger, larger possible shifts during training. And so this gives us more robustness. And what we see is that as the uh, radius of the ball increases in plot B, we get that the loss of a number of these methods is um, decreasing. And so we're getting better performance because we're more robust. Um, across the different methods, the, the differences are in the choice of divergence used. So, you know, we talked about KLA divergence. There's a number of divergences that you could use. And these matter, and uh, these, these have implications on what the robustness and performance of the models is going to be. And so it's important to figure out how to, how to choose those. And then finally, um, the, other, the, the, the last thing that we see is that if we look at the performance on the unshifted um, data, so plot A, um, as we increase the, the radius, so as we increase the robustness, we actually get worse performance on the unshifted distribution. Um, and, and this is an idea that we'll see sort of reappear um, as, as we continue forward. So now taking a step back and comparing, you know, previously we heard about the surgery estimator, which is sort of indicative of this class of proactive, reliable learning uh, methods that we've been talking about and contrasting it with what we've just seen with bounded distributional robustness. Um, the, the, so, some, some key points to consider are that with these reliable learning methods, um, shifts, we define the shifts by reasoning about variables and dependencies in the graph that can change. So we looked at the graph of the pneumonia example and we determined that the style features um, are the ones that should change. And we weren't tied to a particular data set um, in order to, to define the kinds of shifts we were talking about. Um, we were able to talk about them abstractly and, and connect them to the data that we have. Um, with distributional robustness, what we saw is that this ball, and as Suchi's question sort of pointed out, this ball is centered around um, the training data that we're given. And so we're very much so tied, this notion of robustness is tied to the data, the, the training data set that we have. Um, a second important point is, uh, you know, we were talking about a causal perspective with reliable learning and, and using those graphs. And, and this is just reiterating that um, we're reasoning about um, what shifts make sense to protect against um, by interrogating this graph and seeing, you know, what, what does it tell us about um, the problem that we're considering. And as a result of that, it means that um, we're able to consider um, arbitrary shifts. And so we have guarantees about the optimality and then the correctness of this procedure, that it does give us something that is um, stable to um, arbitrary shifts in these pieces that we've determined we want to protect against. By contrast, by virtue of being bounded, uh, bounded distributional robustness is, is giving um, performance guarantees regarding um, environments that are within these bounded norm shifts. And so um, this arbitrary magnitude versus bounded norm shift is, is, a, is a key difference here. And finally, um, while mathematically convenient, the notion of, of talking about robustness in terms of these um, divergence balls um, is mathematically convenient, but it can be difficult to translate that into concepts that are easy to understand um, for a domain expert and to communicate them. So to put it all together, um, to put it all together, um, these, these two methods, distribute, bounded distributional robustness and, and sort of reliable learning and considering arbitrary shifts, um, one interesting aspect would be to consider how we can combine them because in, in many practical scenarios, we want these kinds of mixed robustness guarantees where we know that some variables are likely to shift by a small amount. And so we can, we can consider bounded robustness there, but for others, we require the same um, arbitrary magnitude um, robustness that we've talked about before. So looking at yet um, another framing and another class of approaches, um, this, this goes under the name invariant risk minimization or IRM. And um, taking, just like reliable learning, this takes a causal view. But the, the key difference here is that um, rather than starting with a graph, we're gonna implicitly reason about the underlying graph using data sets which are collected from um, different environments. And so the, the, the main principle we're working off of is that to learn invariances across environments, we wanna find a data representation such that the optimal classifier on top of that representation matches for all environments. 
So more simply put, we want to learn a representation that produces an invariant and optimal um, predictor across the environments. Um, and so from these data sets that we've been given. And so this gives, this, this naturally has a, um, a particular type of guarantee associated with it, um, which um, is that when it talks about when shifts occur in all, variab all variables except the target variable that we're predicting, then we're able to recover and um, the, the, that the optimal predictor is to predict a variable y given its parents in the graph. And we do that by taking multiple data sets where we see these shifts in all these different variables and we extract that invariance. So again, contrasting um, reliable learning and now uh, invariant risk minimization. Um, with reliable learning, we were starting with a causal graph. And in what we'll discuss next, we're going to actually relax this. Um, but with IRM, it, you know, instead of starting with a graph, we're going to take sufficiently diverse data sets where we have examples of all these types of shifts so that we can extract invariances. Uh, with reliable learning, we're selecting which shifts to protect against. Um, while with invariant risk minimization, it's protecting against the shifts that it sees in the data sets. And so we can't sort of selectively choose which ones to protect against, which ones not to protect against. Um, with reliable learning, we get these um, general guarantees to the, the particular specified shifts. So these um, performance guarantees and, and correctness guarantees with regards to the shifts that we're specifying. Um, whereas with invariant risk minimization, it's very much so tied to seeing shifts in um, all these variables except the target variable in order to, to get the, um, the, the, the desired invariance. Um, and as a sort of a practical note, what we saw with the imaging example that, that Sushi gave with pneumonia x-rays, um, to apply to, to data like images, this sort of structured data, there's um, some pre-processing that needs to happen to extract um, like semantic concepts from the images. Whereas um, invariant risk minimization can sort of be directly applied to, to that kind of um, structured data. Um, and, and so in, in directly contrasting these two, what we see is that, you know, can we relax the need for having a specified graph? Because this can be difficult to produce up front while still retaining the benefits of, of having general guarantees to um, specified shifts and, and not being tied again to only what's in the data. Um, Right. So it sounds like other sh if we, the challenge with, you know, if we had a graph available, the good news is we can much more easily visually, intuitively reason about the domain with experts. We can more easily, um, you know, reason about is there a shift we want to protect from, not protect from, to what degree does it really matter? Uh, but effectively, so we have a lot more flexibility with the reliable learning slash surgery estimator method. Um, on the flip side though, you have to work harder because you don't have a graph. It's you, what you have is data sets. And if you had a collection of data sets, the good news is you can apply IRM and you can get something out that's actually nice. Um, but you have less um, control and flexibility and also guarantees in terms of the quality of the outputs and what you're able to protect against. Is that correct? Yep, that's exactly right. So this is... Go ahead. So this is um, motivating um, what we're talking about next, which is an approach for um, avoiding the need to specify the causal graph upfront while still getting um, these guarantees and still being able to actually learn a graph from data. So this is, this is called iSpec, and, and just like the surgery estimator, um, this is in line with the proactive failure prevention paradigm that we talked about, where we want to learn models that are robust to um, problematic shifts that we've identified. But uh, the, the difference, difference here is we're going to start from the data. Like exactly. we don't know anything a priori, we just have a data set, we have a domain, and we're starting from there. Yep. So we're, start, we're going to learn that graph instead. So we're going to learn this graphical specification and it's going to have um, some nice properties we'll go through, which is that it actually will help us identify um, candidate shifts that occurred across the data set. But then as before, because we have a graphical representation, we can specify which shifts to pr protect against and we can reason about them um, and ultimately produce an algorithm that will produce a stable predictor to those um, shifts with um, the guarantees that we've spoken about. So in order to accomplish this goal of learning the graph, um, we're gonna use structure learning. 
And so structured learning is exactly the, about going from um, data to learning graphs. And um, uh, some of this should hopefully be familiar um, from uh, Kun Zhang's uh, sessions where he's talked in depth about structure learning, but we're gonna recap some of the most um, relevant points, which is that stru structure learning essentially works in, in two steps. Um, we're gonna take our data and we're going to um, look at it and test for conditional independences in the data, which give us information about the structure of the graph. And so it implies missing edges in the graph, producing what we call a skeleton. So this is where we have our variables and we have um, edges um, connecting them, but we haven't oriented the edges. So we haven't placed arrowheads yet. In order to place the arrowheads, we're gonna do a second step, which is we're gonna use some rules and constraints. For example, we don't want cycles. Um, and there's a number of these sorts of rules which help us orient as many edges as possible. And when we're done with this process of orienting as many edges as possible, the result is that um, we're gonna get a, a partial graph because we may still have some edges that we failed to orient. And so um, here we have an example of a partial graph of the output of one of these procedures. It's a partial ancestral graph. And what makes it different from the fully specified graphs we've been seeing before are that we see that there are these circle edges, um, these cir or rather these circle marks at the end of some of these edges. And so intuitively, these are, are showing us that there's uncertainty in the edge orientation. So while the edge from G to L is, is just directed, it means that you know, we recovered it with certainty. But the edge from G to S has this circle mark, which means that either um, G is a parent of S, or um, there's it's a bidirected edge representing that there's some sort of unobserved common cause between the two variables. Um, so there's a, there's a latent confounder between them. Um, and so the, more, more generally, um, you know, structural learning is an active area of research. There's many methods for going from data to graphs, um, and, and these can be employed for this problem. But we're specifically just gonna look at um, a particular alg algorithm which goes from a data to the, the PAG that we saw before and accounts for the effects of unobserved variables. So um, to, to, to remind ourselves you know, why we're talking about structural learning, uh, the, the, the point here is we wanted to represent these um, the set of environments we're considering graphically. So what happens under shifts graphically? And so the structure of the graph tells us about the data generating process and tells us about um, our problem. And then what we wanna do is identify, for example, with this S node, um, we wanna identify and point to pieces or conditionals in this graph, where if we shift these conditionals, we produce the new environments. And so we would like to um, be able to um, construct this um, with the help of data. <clears throat> and, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the question is, can we learn this invariant spec, the graph and the candidate shifts across environments using multiple data sets? And fortunately, due to structure learning, um, the answer is yes. And so the way, that this, uh, the way that this works is we are given data sets from multiple environments. Um, so we consider that um, I, we have data sets collected across different locations or across different years, and these produce different environments. In order to learn, um, in order to learn the structure, we're going to pull the data sets and we're going to add this new variable E, um, which represents sort of, it, it's just dividing the data sets and corresponds to the different environments. So whether it was location, year, um, wherever the data is coming from. And when, you, when we apply structure learning, we're going to recover the graph as before, um, but um, there's gonna be um, two properties. So one in, in, in plot A, we have, the, we have a fully specified graph. So we imagine that we have data that's generated from this graph and there's different environments E. And what the graph structure shows us is that because E um, has an edge to X1, we know that the shifts across environments are occurring because, um, because of changes to the distribution of X1. So when we get this data, we pool it and we add, um, we add this indicator variable E, we'll learn the PAG in plot B. And so it recovers, the struct, it, it recovers most of the structure. It's a partial graph. So we see there's some of those circle marks we talked about before. But importantly, we're still able to recover that there's an edge between E and X1. And so what that means is that things that are, things that are dependent on E, things that have this edge with E in the learned partial graph, um, these are candidates for shifts across the data sets. This is what the algorithm detected as depending on the environment, um, as variables that depend on, on the environment. So um, given that we learn, learn a PAG um, and we see what variables are, um, are touching or are affected by the environment indicator, uh, 
that means we have a set of candidate shifts. So now we get to reason about this graph, very similar to before, about um, which are the ones we actually wanna protect against. So in this very simple example, there's only one candidate shift and it makes sense to then specify with this S node that we want to protect against shifts in X1. Um, and, and so this sort of demonstrates this process that we can go from these data sets to learn the structure of the graph. The graph actually suggests to us what candidate shifts were uh, across the different data sets. Um, and then we can still reason graphically about them in order to determine which shifts we want to protect against. And one thing here is we don't have to, we can also add additional chips, right? So this is a candidate starting point. Like from the data, what we're learning is what are the likely shifts? Now, some of the recommendations of likely shifts could be because we just have limited data. It's because of variance. It's thinking that's an actual, uh, something that's an actual source of shift that in reality, you don't think it's as big a deal. Alternatively, there are things that are actually big deals that uh, is recovered from the data that you do decide you want to protect from. And then additionally, you may have limited data because you have one, two or three data sets, but you know a lot about the world, you know about the domain, you know where you're deploying things. So there may be other area, uh, you know, other environments you want to deploy that you don't think you can collect data from, but you understand what could vary about that environment that isn't in your data. And now you can take this sort of recovered invariant spec and add additional, um, you know, add additional, uh, identify additional shifts you want to protect from and, you know, specify that in the invariant spec. Yep. So what we've seen is that with structure learning, we're able to accomplish the, the, the first three steps, which is learning the, the graphical structure from data, finding candidate shifts, um, and then specifying ultimately what shifts we actually want to protect from. And so then what's needed now is, is an algorithm that will um, produce a, a model that's stable to those shifts that we've specified. And then again, has those correctness and optimality guarantees, um, which produces a, a procedure that's very analogous to the, the surgery estimator that we discussed before. The key difference being that um, we don't have to start with the fully specified spec. We can start from Data, input data sets um, to learn the graph, then we can um, specify the shifts. And then as before, we can algorithmically determine what the optimal stable distribution is and what sort of the, the pieces are that make, uh, that, that compose it that we need to build models for and the recipe for how to combine those models in order to predict. Um, and so this again comes with these correctness and, and, and optimality guarantees, but what the difference is, is that we've been able to um, uh, learn the graph from data and then reason about it from there, as opposed to being forced to, to come up and specify it up front. So uh, to, to kind of demonstrate this workflow, uh, did you have something to add, Suchi? Actually, do you want to say anything, others about optimality? Because, or will we come back to it later? I think we may not have, um, maybe this would be a good time to comment on kind of optimality before we switch gears to work through an actual example. Yeah, um, so the, it, this is, it's, it's the same guarantee as we had for the um, surgery estimator, which to recall is that for the, uh, the environments that are specified by, the set of environments specified by the graph, um, we're gonna produce the optimal invariant predictor amongst those. Um, and, and so we are able to extract that um, even from the partial graph. Now, the fact that you're now learning from data instead of actually starting with a graph that's given to you, does that compromise the quality of the guarantees in any way against um, what we previously heard? Because we heard that the surgery estimator was both um, uh, you know, optimal and then also we gave soundness completeness arguments for it. Um, yeah, how does that compare to this? Yeah, the, the main difference is with respect to what we're able to recover from the data, we're optimal. But the difference may be, and, and we saw this in going from a, a full graph to the learned PAG, the increased uncertainty means that um, we have less information from a partial graph than we do from a full graph. And so there may be differences in that if we had a full graph, um, we, we would know that there's more stable information that we could be using and we could produce a better predictor. But given the information that we have um, from the data alone, um, 
the, the, the guarantee we get is that we're doing the best that we can. But with more information, if we were able to get rid of uncertainty about edge orientations, then there is opportunity uh, to do better. Got it. So now we're going to walk through um, an example of, of, of um, the workflow for iSpec on a real example um, where the task we're considering is patient triage. So we have um, patients in the intensive care unit at a hospital, and we want to identify the patients who are most at risk of dying in order to figure out how to allocate hospital resources, for example. And so... And just to connect this back to the first uh, part of the presentation, then yesterday we brought up this example. I'd given, I'd motivated how it's very, very dangerous if predictors, like, you know, let's say you've built a solution for recognizing, um, you know, whether which patient is at risk for a complication or doing diagnoses. And if, for example, your predictor is very dependent on things like subtle changes in uh, practice patterns, like how your clinicians are placing orders, something you don't expect it to be, um, you know, it, biology shouldn't be affected by how people tend to order things, then, um, the, you know, a model that is sensitive to it actually produces, can easily produce very nonsensical outputs. And so yesterday I'd sort of showed one uh, result of how if you were to train and test a robust model uh, from, you know, motivated by the paper shown here, we actually showed that you could develop something that is stable across environments that would be stable to ordering patterns. But in that example, I'd assume that the graph and the dependencies were given. But in this scenario, we're now going to start from scratch and we'll just assume we know nothing, right? So we're starting from data. Exactly. And so the, the, surprising, the surprising thing here, the problem that, that arises in this sort of domain is that, as Suji mentioned, you know, we expect our, our clinical models to depend on um, variables that tell me something about the patient and their health, so their heart rate, their blood pressure, things like this. But surprisingly, mach machine learning models trained in the setting um, can be very sensitive, if you're not careful, to um, these sorts of things related to um, the behavior of doctors and things that vary across hospitals and related to policy, like when and how often measurements are taken. And so um, these shifts create um, these shifts create sort of the, the problems that we want to um, that we want to protect against in, in this task. So, as far as formalizing the problem goes, we're looking at the first 24 hours of data from patients in the intensive care unit, and we want to predict their um, mortality. And so, to consider the different environments, we're looking at three hospitals, um, three hospitals in our institution's network, and. <clears throat> Our goal is to be able to generalize across hospitals despite these kinds of intra-hospital policy differences. Um, the kinds of features that we're going to be using are, are um, the ones listed here. So we have um, physiologic variables. So these are related to like vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, as well as um, lab tests that get ordered. So things like bicarbonate. Um, demographics, um, so general information about the patient, age, gender, chronic diseases, things tied to the patient history. Um, admission type, so uh, sort of the circumstances surrounding the admission. Was it a scheduled surgery? Was it an emergency uh, medical visit? Um, what type of admission was it? And then finally, um, this variable lab timing, which um, again is, is this practice and policy-based um, variable, which is going to, to be affected by um, differences between policies across the hospitals. And so um, this is gonna create um, issues uh, for, for generalizing across the hospitals. So we know that in order to start, what we want to do is learn the structure of the graph um, so that we can start reasoning about it. And so here, um, we're going to learn the, the partial graph, the PAG, um, using the data set ID, so, so which hospital the data is coming from as this environment indicator. So we can pull data um, to, to learn this graph. Um, and one of the things is, when you do have prior knowledge, you are able to incorporate it as constraints into structure learning. And so structure learning implementations readily allow for this. So for example, um, when we learn this graph, we specify just a, a, a high level um, topological ordering of which variables um, have, we know sort of have to precede other variables. So it's listed there um, on, on the right. Demographics and, and chronic diseases, for example, things that um, are true about and we know about a patient before they come to the hospital have to proceed things like the admission type, um, their, the measurements that get taken, and ultimately mortality, which all happen after they 
um, after they visit the hospital. And so, so just to clarify, basically what we had was data set from a few different hospitals, right? So you had data set one, data set two, data set three, each of them had these 17 variables that were in the previous slide. And what others did was augment each of these data sets with this additional column, which is said, which data set does it come from? And that's the data set ID. So now instead of having 17 variables, you have 18 variables. But the 18th variable is, set, is the data set ID. And now we're applying structure learning to this pooled data set graph. So you're just taking the three spreadsheets or three data sets augmented with the data set ID column, and then you're pooling them together. And now we're applying structure learning to it. And when we apply structure learning, out comes a graph like this. And this may look daunting actually, but it's pretty cool. This is one of my favorite things. So let others will walk through it in more detail. So the, the graph recovers, so here we're going to look at a particular piece, but more generally talk about the fact that um, the, the, the graph recovers interpretable insights. And so this is, this is what we're talking about when we're saying we can reason about um, the, the structure that's, that's recovered. Um, <clears throat> so for example, in, in what's shown here, we see that there's um, an edge from age to mortality. So age is a parent of mortality and indicating that age is a risk factor that ultimately impacts um, mortality. Uh, we also have that lab timing variable. This was that policy, um, that, that sort of policy dependent variable. And it has a bi-directional edge uh, with mortality. And so remember, a bi-directed edge means that there's some unobserved common cause. And so we, we can sort of posit that um, lab order times are associated with mortality, but they don't actually have an effect themselves on mortality. Um, <clears throat> similarly, uh, admit type, so the type of admission, um, has a bidirectional bi um, edge with mortality. And again, that bidirected edge is suggesting a latent cause. And so, for example, the underlying condition that caused this patient to need to go to the hospital, and that ultimately will um, be a risk factor for whether or not they end up dying during their visit. Uh, so, and not all of these insights that we're getting are necessarily about teaching you something new. That's not the goal here. In part, some of these insights are just corroborating, like the three insights we've listed here are just kind of corroborating that the resulting graph behaves as expected. So that's what we did. We pulled out three examples where you know this to be true. Does the resulting graph kind of agree with it? Yep. And so um, remember that, that uh, for the purposes of determining shifts, one of the nice properties of learning the graph is that um, if we look at variables that are um, connected to the environment indicator, which remember for us was this data set ID denoting which hospital the data came from, we get candidate shifts, candidates um, for shifts that occurred across the data set. So this is what the algorithm determined as um, variables with distributions, which varied um, by data set. Um, and so we list, we list some uh, on the next slide, um, which we can um, talk about more like uh, what's shown is an edge from data set ID to age, suggesting that there's a difference in the populations that are visiting the different hospitals. Um, for example, older patients attending hospital one, um, while a, a broader mix of patients at hospital two. Um, there's also shifts in physiologic variables like um, bicarbonate or heart rate. Um, which suggests differences in, in the severity and uh, in the, the severity of the conditions of the, the patients as well as sort of the treatments that um, these, these patients are receiving and, and the care that they're receiving. And then importantly, um, this lab time association, which we ahead of time believed would be um, problematic, is confirmed by the graph uh, that it's, it's, it is affected by the data set ID, meaning that there are practice patterns that differ across the hospitals which produce differing uh, lab time distributions. And so given the graph structure, given um, candidate sh shifts suggested by the graph, what we're doing is now we want to specify what exactly is it that we, want to, um, that we want to protect against. And so one thing to realize is that there's the default choice that we could make. Um, which would be to just say, oh, the graph suggested um, these 12 variables as possible candidates for shifts. So let's say that we want to protect against shifts in all of these variables. Um, and so, you know, this is similar to approaches where you, you take these data sets and you're automatically forced into protecting against all shifts that are detected across the data sets. And you don't get to choose. 
Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a conservative choice, as we'll show. Because um, by reasoning about the graph, what we might, what we might um, realize is that some of, these, uh, some of these shifts relate to physiologic variables. We saw that heart rate and bicarbonate, for example, were variables that had shifts. But these are, these are clinically relevant because these have to deal with, for example, the treatments that the patients were receiving and sort of this other information that is actually relevant for predicting mortality. Um, but some of the shifts that relate to hospital policy, so things like the types of admits at the hospital um, tells you about the types of procedures that the hospital is, is willing to perform, and then lab timing clearly depends on um, policies relating to how often, um, how often things are measured. And so we might say that we only want to protect against these policy-related shifts, which in this case um, are admit type and lab time. So as opposed to the conservative choice where we're, we're saying that we're specifying that we want to protect against all 12 possible candidate shifts, um, we can also consider looking at um, just these two shifts um, uh, and, and protecting against those policy-related shifts. And, and more generally, this is one of the advantages is we can consider different choices of, of specifications and, and see, um, see sort of the, the resulting effects on, on what we're learning and, and the resulting effects on model stability. So, in fact, we use this to, to motivate um, sort of three models that we're going to consider in, in looking at their performance. Um, one is an unstable model where we just ignore the fact that there's any shifts across hospitals. We're just going to, to um, train sort of a standard um, classification model using the all 17 features as input. Uh, then we have this conservative model, which corresponds to protecting against all 12 candidate shifts that we discussed before. Um, and then um, sort of after reasoning about it and using the, the iSpec framework and, and methodology for, for thinking about this, um, we'll let that denote the one where we're only protecting against those policy related shifts that we said um, are going, uh, we, we believe are gonna be most problematic. Um, and so we, we took these three approaches, we trained all models on data from the first hospital, and then we're going to look at um, sort of, uh, we're gonna look at performance across the three hospitals when we test on held out patients at, at each one. So here we're measuring performance in terms of AUC, so measuring our ability to, to discriminate between um, patients who died and, and, and didn't. Um, so the blue mo so each sort of subplot is a different hospital, and the blue model corresponds to the unstable model where we don't do anything to protect against shifts. And so what we see is that this does the best at hospital one, at the hospital where um, the models were trained, but that it experiences degradation. Uh, and so the performance um, decreases as we move from hospital one to hospitals two and three. And there's actually a very big decrease when we go from hospital one to hospital three, um, a, a indicating that sort of there was this strong deterioration in performance and that we learned this unstable dependency that, uh, that varied across the hospitals. By contrast, um, we see that the, the conservative and iSpec models, these are both stable models which are protecting against shifts. And so these have performance that, um, that doesn't deteriorate um, across the hospitals. There's some variation, which is to be expected because there are different um, patient populations across hospitals. Um, but we're, we're not experiencing the, de the, the decay because of learning a sort of a wrong dependency or a dependency that's unstable and is changing across the hospitals. And in comparing, between the conservative and iSpec models, remember that the difference here was for the conservative model, we specified the 12 candidate shifts that were found by the graph. Whereas with iSpec, we reasoned that there were really only two of these that um, we felt were most relevant um, to, to protect <coughs> against. And so by protecting against too many shifts, you're actually overly constraining the dependencies that you're able to learn. And so you're, while you're getting performance that's stable and doesn't deteriorate, um, the performance at an absolute level is, is simply too low to be useful. And so the, the, by being sort of by reasoning about which shifts to protect against, we kind of are able to get the best of both worlds in that um, the model does have properties of, of stable performance, um, but we're not throwing away um, sort of all of the information available to us um, in, in predicting. Anything to add, Suchi? I would... Adish, can you comment on like, why is it that the green isn't all at one level? Like we are still seeing some variability across uh, the data sets in terms of the performance of the ice spec estimator, right? Yeah, so um, as I briefly mentioned, this, this has to do with, um, there are differences 
um, you know, in the, in the populations that you're seeing across the hospitals. And so these relatively smaller variations will produce um, variations in, in the performance. Um, but it's, it's, it's different than sort of the, the variations that are produced by learning a dependency and a, a predictive association um, that's unstable and may ultimately be wrong when you move from one hospital to another. Got it. So you're saying this kind of variability we're seeing across the data sets is to be expected because it's just due to, you know, um, it's like any other scenario we'd see in machine learning where even if the data were sampled from the exact same environment, just because there's differences in the underlying data distribution, and in this particular case, there's differences in the population acuity, like some uh, hospital three has different mix of severity than hospital one, we're, we're gonna see that. But in terms of stability, it is protecting from the unstable shifts we did care about, which was um, we don't want the model to be dependent on provider practice patterns. And you know, that's effectively what the stability is getting us. Yep. Um, and just to, to look at performance measured in um, a different way, um, I think we had actually seen this in um, the, the, ex the example that um, Suji had talked about in the previous session, but we can look at, uh, we can look at sort of consistency in predictions um, for models that are trained at, at different hospitals. So, so what we're saying is if we train a, 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 a model at hospital one, we train that model at hospital two, and we have both predict on the same set of patients, um, how consistent are the rankings of the patients by uh, predicted risk of mortality? So how, how um, consistent are the predictions across training at, at different um, hospitals? And what this is showing is that for the unstable model, the patient rate, this predicting on the same set of patients, the rankings can vary widely. We see that this um, correlation of those predictions um, can, can sort of vary wildly and can be very low. Whereas for the conservative and iSpec models, they have significantly tighter and higher um, correlation in the, the, the patient rankings, which means that they're producing stable patient orderings by risks and would lead to, for example, more consistent triage decisions, um, irrespective of where we train the models. Right, and that's crucial because it would be very, very jarring for a user, in this case, a clinician or a caregiver, if, they're, if a doctor, they're trying to figure out you know, whether to put this patient in the ICU or not, and small changes in the data gives you wildly different results, you're not gonna trust it. And what you really want, ideally, the model to learn is something, you know, that's stable biology. And that's effectively what this is showing. So, um, so I guess others, this, maybe this is the time we switch gears and talk about the stability accuracy trade-off. So one thing you pointed out was, um, one thing you pointed out in your results was basically this notion that, um, you had different choices of stable estimators. So it's not like stability, when you're trying to look for stability, the answer is there's one most performant algorithm, right? There's naturally a trade-off where you can decide how conservative you need to be, but even conservative is maybe not the right word because it really need, depends on the needs. Like in a particular domain, when you're trying to deploy, you're trying to think about, you know, truly reasoning about the domain, truly reasoning about shifts you expect to exist, and then working backward to understand what are the most important shifts to protect from. And in this example, we sort of did this version of like two different candidates, one that was, you know, considered all possible shifts, another that reasoned backward from the domain to identify the most important ones that we care to generalize um, against and, uh, and produce two different models. And when we look at them, we see that there is actually some notion of a stability and accuracy trade-off. So there are two stable models. Um, both of these stable models are going to be less performant in the actual original domain. So if all of your test environments were exactly like the original, uh, the, the data set collect collected from your training environment, then just by virtue of imposing these additional constraints around stability, you're going to lose performance because you're obviously forcing the model to not learn certain things because you don't expect it to generalize. So that's sort of to be expected. But then there's a stability accuracy trade-off because you can have multiple stable models, but there is a notion of some models are more accurate than other stable models. And the degree to which we care about certain kinds of stability versus accuracy is the trade-off we have to think about. 
And here, I mean, um, and, and sort of this trade-off, this notion of stability accuracy trade-off is like very core concept and something that um, as we train more models for doing, uh, you know, uh, for reliability or robustness, we'll have to be cognizant of. And there's been a, a growing body of papers in the last few, few years on this topic, uh, very exciting papers, taking various perspectives, like we said, the three big perspectives in terms of how to go about learning these kinds of stable models. One of the big challenges though, is that with this growing body of work, it's been very, like each one is proposing a method, doing some kind of learning, showing some kind of stability, and showing some kind of gains in empirical performance on a data set. But what's been very hard is to then go backwards a little bit and think a little bit about, you know, is there a framework in which we can compare them? Is there a way to think about where do different pieces of work sit from a stability accuracy trade off standpoint? Is one optimizing for some types of stability? Is it about bounded guarantees or is it again guarantees against arbitrary shifts? And from an accuracy perspective, given certain stability guarantees, are the models optimal? Are they the best performing models in that class? Or are they, is there something better we can do? Um, and then do we have the ability to um, kind of uh, nudge or control um, the, um, you know, how we learn from data or specify uh, different types of uh, invariances so that we, we can, you know, uh, understand the quality of the outputs we're getting. So, so effectively, like, is there a way we can compare these different frameworks? Is there a way to figure out, like, what are the different types of guarantees they're giving? And some notion of thinking through when is which type of approach better? And furthermore, are there scenarios where we have certain types of stability guarantees we could give, but maybe there is an option to build something that is more optimal than what exists? And so, this naturally leads into the next topic, which I'll only give you a preview today, and then we'll cover in the next uh, part three of this tutorial. Um, and the uh, overall concept here is, turns out, as we showed, you know, you can think about this. Uh, we spoke about different ways to represent shifts intuitively uh, in given a problem area and given a data set. You could intuitively learn everything, which is sort of naively how we used to train machine learning models, right? Where we didn't care about stability. So you take your data and you learn everything. And when you're learning everything from your data without any constraints, you're basically including lots of spurious dependencies. Um, on the flip side, you could learn conservatively and ignore um, only stable relationships that, uh, sorry, you could learn conservatively, which is you can drop all sorts of edges on the graph and you can only learn um, you know, some very limited set of dependencies, but then the challenge is maybe um, there are relationships in the graph um, that you're ignoring, right? So depends on your algorithm for dropping edges, but if your algorithm is um, picking up too many edges and picking up a lot of the unstable edges, it will lead to an unstable algorithm. If it's dropping a ton of edges and only retaining the um, stable edges is going to produce something stable, but in the process, it's possible it'll drop a ton of stable edges that maybe otherwise could have been retained. And that partly depends on the algorithm that is going from um, the raw data into the resulting estimator. So here, by looking at a, taking a graphical perspective, it is actually possible to reason about optimality and the state you know the stability accuracy trade-off and start putting every one of these algorithms into um into a framework for understanding the degree to which they're leaving they're not uh, you know they're leaving information at the table in other words there are edges that should be learning that it's not learning that are indeed stable and on the flip side it's capturing unstable edges which really it shouldn't be learning altogether and and based on that you can effectively characterize these different um, techniques. Um, last slide here to end, which is turns out you can take a lot of these methods and create what is what we describe as a hierarchy, where effectively um, the way you're getting this hierarchy is at the end of the day, an algorithm is, you can think of every, many of these algorithms as like operators on a graph, where operator means it's adding or removing edges. And every time 
it keeps an edge, it's learning it. If it removes the edge, it's forgetting that relationship or not learning that particular dependency from the data. And if you take that view, you can take some of these existing algorithms and describe them in this sort of um, um, you know, ladder view where the conditional distribution is sort of on top, easiest to learn from data. Uh, graph pruning is an example of that. We'll walk you through in the next slide, um, next um, part, like how graph pruning works. What does the graph pruning estimator look like? But effectively, what graph pruning does is drops a ton of edges. In fact, drops a ton of stable edges. And so what you learn is it's easy to produce. You can often get a, um, some estimator using graph pruning, but turns out from an accuracy perspective, it's not going to be very accurate because it's dropping a ton of stable information. On the flip side, um, this you know, third level of the hierarchy, counterfactual distributions, um, this take advantage of specific types of operators for manipulating and removing and adding edges on a graph. Um, the good news is it retains a lot more of the stable information. So it retains many more of the black edges or the stable edges. On the flip side, um, they, it is, um, on the flip side, it's not always easy to, easy to estimate from data, easy to estimate from, um, uh, easy to estimate from uh, graphs because it relies on very certain assumptions and those assumptions may not always be valid. Now, the other advantage of sort of thinking from this point of view is the fact that, um, you know, while we can walk through what examples currently exist and how they relate, it also motivates this idea of like where there is opportunity to produce new ideas. Because I think there's an opportunity here to, you know, increase precision further by retaining as much of the stable information as possible. And we're, we'll talk through the framework to see, you know, how do we think about where the gap is based on current literature. So with that, I'll pause. We're just at the hour. Great to be here again. This is part three of three. Um, so, um, and almost near the end. So just as a quick recap, thus far, we've covered different approaches or frameworks for approaching the problem of building models that do not fail when shifts occur in the data. On day one, we spoke at length about why this is such a pervasive problem. Um, it's everywhere we need. Um, you know, we spoke about several different forms of these um, ways in which manifests in the data. Um, and we gave many, many practical examples. And then last, uh, yesterday, we covered um, these different frameworks like reliable learning or invariant risk minimization or bounded distributional robustness, which are each coming at this problem in um, uh, slightly different ways. Um, we compared the benefits of these different frameworks in terms of the quality of the guarantees, the types of stability they're trying to impose, and the degree to which they give uh, performance models and performance is measured using accuracy and uh, consistency of output. Um, and so near the end, we started talking about, um, you know, it, uh, we, we need a framework. So there are many, many more algorithms um, being written uh, that fall in this genre now. And one of the big challenges is it's very hard to currently compare them with regard to their stability accuracy trade-off. So what we mean by that is um, to what degree is this algorithm stable and to what degree can I get guarantees on the kind of stability I'm able to impose with it. Um, and then the second axis that we often care about is, well, we want certain stability guarantees, but we also want the we also want the algorithm to be accurate or performant. And so, if they're not very accurate, we're stable but not very accurate. That's not very good. And so, how do you um, you know can we can we analyze the algorithms from a stability accuracy trade-off point um, point of view? And there isn't a sort of a clear way to do that yet. Um, so, so can we analyze these different classes under the lens of stability accuracy trade-off? Um, turns out there's a graphical edge-based framework for analysis, which could be one type of approach for resolving this gap. And so we'll review the idea today. So to, um, to talk through that, um, you know, no matter what data set you have, no matter what application you're tackling, 
there's always an underlying data generating process that's driving the data generation. And, there's, and that data generating process can be represented using a graph. So many times in machine learning, there's a misconception that when they're solving a machine learning problem, you know, is it a problem that is a problem about graphs or is it a problem that doesn't involve graphs? And so just to clarify, pretty much no matter what data set you have, no matter what domain you're tackling, there's almost always an underlying graph. There's the question of the degree to which the graph is explicit in your head and the degree to which the graph is given to you. Now, in the uh, previous, uh, like, like, uh, like yesterday, we spoke about how you could learn these graphs from data and then you could start reasoning about it. You can also do, uh, interact with domain experts to get access to it. Now, in order to be able to use this kind of a graphical perspective to start reasoning about the uh, stability, accuracy, um, uh, trade-off that these different algorithms are striking and how they compare with respect to the stability accuracy trade-off, turns out you don't need access to the true graph for a problem. You can just theoretically reason about it using a graphical perspective. And so here's intuitively how you think about it. So the first thing is, let's say there exists a graph that defines the data generating distribution. Now, the guiding principle here is one of minimal deletion, which is given a graph, you can talk about, uh, you know, uh, dependencies in the graph that are stable and dependencies that are not stable. And so in order to get a stable model or model that is, um, um, stable to or invariant to perturbations in certain these unstable edges, um, you want to basically see if from the re if the resulting model includes any of the dependencies that would have been on the unstable edges of the graph. And the principle of minimal deletion says when I'm learning a model, I can somehow um, think of it as um, doing operations on a graph where I'm only retaining the edges in the graph that the model is actually capturing. And when I uh, look at this graph and I look at the resulting edges that the model captures, I want to delete only those edges that are unstable or that cause shifts. So in other words, I want to retain, if you could, if you remember previously, we had sort of this notion of, um, you know, a given graph and the notion of stable and unstable edges, where we talked about stable edges in black and unstable edges in red. And then the concept here was, we want to retain as many of the black edges as possible. And we want to, uh, you know, remove all the, in fact, I'm going to copy this here. So you have sort of an example to look at, right? So that's basically what uh, this concept is telling you, which is when you're learning a model, effectively you're doing some graph transformation and the resulting model, you can think of it as how many of the black edges does it retain, how many, how, and whether it deletes all the red edges or not. And then minimal deletion from an optimality standpoint is we will only want to delete all the red edges, right? That would be optimal. We've captured as much stable information as we could and we've um, deleted as much of the unstable information as we could, right? So that's intuitively the whole graphical perspective. And so, now, if you get that, you're good. And like everything else from here is details. Like how do we go about actually uh, implementing this framework in practice? So in order to compare different methods, you can then ask the following question. Which parts of the graph or distribution are they learning? What dependencies or what edges are they deleting? Are the things that they're deleting stable or unstable? And the degree to which the deletions that are being made, if there are a lot of stable distributions, that will impact the accuracy. If there are lots of unstable distributions being kept, that will impact the stability of the resulting model. And therefore, you can reason about the stability accuracy trade-off. Now, another thing that's interesting about this perspective is this now directly allows you to define new algorithms that directly relate learning to graph transformations. Because you can now just think about it as, can I, in general, define these new algorithms that delete all the red edges and keep all the black edges? And if so, what are my tricks or what are my operators for doing so? So far, so good. So here I'm giving you 
you know, three different classes of common operators people have studied, and turns out they can be kind of arranged in a hierarchy. And I'll give you examples of algorithms that fall under each. So the first one calls conditional, second is interventional, third is counterfactual. For a second, don't worry about the names. The more important and interesting thing to think about here is the following, which is the estimators or the models estimated at level N of the hierarchy, which is level N distributions have the same stability as distributions at the level below. So like below means at a lower level. So distributions at level three have the same level of stability guarantees as distributions at level two and level one. In other words, they're as stable and they're not compromising on stability. However, distributions at level three have higher accuracy. So what that means is in practice, you want to be able to build algorithms that take you further down, like, you know, like increasing levels of hierarchy, right? So you want to have the same stability guarantees, but higher and higher accuracy. So with that in mind, let's walk through a few examples. So let's start from one that is very commonly used and it's at level one of the hierarchy. So it guarantees stability, but it compromises on accuracy but it's very, very simple to implement. So the idea for level one, this is called graph pruning, a very uh, um, easy to implement approach. What it does is, let's say you were given data and in your data, you had the following variables you were measuring, y, v, w, x, and z. So don't worry about the graph yet for a second. You just have a data set and that data set is measuring five different variables and your target variable is y, your input variables are V, W, X, and Z, and you're trying to make a predictor or a model based on V, W, X, and Z, okay? So effectively what graph pruning does is to identify the maximal set of features on which to condition so that the resulting model is stable. So I won't tell you how I got there, but in this example, or I'll tell you shortly how I got there, but in this example, just believe me, that the output of graph pruning would be that it would only retain the dependency between V and Y. So in other words, if you were to use the full model, Y given V, Z, X, actually W here is dotted, so it's missing. So I'm gonna remove, so you can't condition on something that's missing. So in the full model, which is your naive model, right? Like you just apply your favorite model to the input data, your, out, your full model would look like Y given V, Z, and X, and turns out this model is unstable. So you might ask, well, why is it unstable? Because when you look at why, there are all these, like just directly this is dependency between Y and X is captured here. So very easy to see that this model is unstable. Now it turns out you might ask, well, is it good enough for me to remove X? And so you can slowly start removing variables and see what resulting part of the graph is left. And on that resulting part of the graph, what are the, this is sort of a, a, a really nice theoretical construct that I uh, urge you to go look up after the fact, this is a take home exercise, but this notion of determining active paths on a graph. So when you have a graph, you can use this concept of de-separation to study, you know, between two nodes, whether there's um, in a graph, there's an active path or not. And if there isn't any active path, then you, you know, you, those, those, nodes are de-separated. Um, so what it's doing here is basically conceptually using that framework of de-separation and active paths to formally analyze it. But for a second, don't worry about the fact that you don't have those tools. It's very easy to apply it. Just the fact that there exists ways by which you can just take a graph and graphically reason for a given model, you can basically ask, given the resulting model, is it stable or not? So it turns out, once you're able to remove W and X and Z, and you end up, if you use graph pruning, the stable model using graph pruning, where the only like tool set it has available to it is, is remove variables one at a time. So when you remove variables one at a time, effectively what you get out of it is Y given V. So that's the best model you can come up with. So the good news is it's stable. The bad news is it's very not, it's not very good because you've left so much of the information off. Like you, you, there are all these black edges here that you basically aren't taking into account. And so as a result, there's all these dependencies in your data that you're not capturing. So far so good. So 
if this makes sense thus far, so then the natural question to ask, and so this is just conditional distributions, right? So this is the first level of the hierarchy. So that natural question is, okay, now that I get this concept, can I do better? But before I go there, let me quickly recap um, this notion of using the graph to capture stability, which is, so the idea was we have a, for every model, we can represent it graphically. And then, um, and the, now that we, if there exists a graphical representation, um, you can basically use the notion of active paths in order to see if a given model is stable or not. So I could use a model and use tons and tons and tons of data sets to measure whether it's stable. But the other super nice thing is that, well, if I could write down, you know, candidate graphs or learn candidate graphs or just posit candidate graphs, then I can directly reason about stability just using the graph itself, which is important because getting data sets from many, many environments is a non-trivial task and you want to get data sets you always want to measure things empirically because maybe there are surprises maybe there are assumptions you made that are not true in practice so the data always helps you debug but this is you know but graphically gives you a bit more assurance that like you know up front de novo you know you're stable and so in this case basically um on a so to assess stability using a graph the key idea is you can write out the graph you can, um, you can basically, for a given model, so let's say our goal was to predict Y, you can essentially come up with the notion of what are all the active paths between Y and all the other variables on the other side of the conditioning set. So if it was Y given X or Y given X comma Z or Y given X comma Z comma V, whatever the conditioning set is on the right, you can effectively list out all the paths and list out all the active paths and if any of these active paths contain an unstable edge, then you know the model is unstable. And you can also pinpoint why is the model unstable. And, and this, uh, this article at the bottom uh, re, um, like gives you, like takes this principle and you know, illustrates it out if you're curious to learn more about it. But effectively, it's a pretty simple technique for just being able to quickly assess if a model is stable or not, and then what can you do to see graphically what could be done differently. Okay. So, so far, so good. So now that you know how to think about assessing graphically whether something is stable or not, the next natural thing to then consider is, you know, as we move up this hierarchy into interventional counterfactual distributions is, can we introduce operators on a graph that will allow us to delete fewer black edges and remove all the red edges? And so yesterday, actually on uh, day one, we covered the surgery estimator, right? And we then covered the whole framework of iSpec. Both iSpec and the surgery estimator are examples of inter interventional distributions. That means level two distributions. So we walked through the whole algorithm, but now let me re-talk about it graphically. What, what uh, the surgery estimator was really doing is on the graph, what it's doing is all of the variables where there are for which there's shifts in the distribution. So in this case, the distribution of X varies across data sets because when this edge is unstable, the generation of X is going to vary across environments. And because the generation of X is gonna vary, we had a selection variable that pointed into X and then the surgery estimator was, going to, was trying to optimize to give you an, a stable estimator that actually is invariant to any changes in the distribution of X. So effectively, what the surgery estimator output gives you graphically, you can represent it. In this example, if we were to want it to be robust to X, this is an example we ran through yesterday, the output of the surgery estimator is this graph. Like graphically, I can represent the output of the surgery estimator as the following. And effectively, what it was doing was doing a do intervention on X. Again, if you, um, you know, I'm, I'm explaining kind of intuitively what it's doing, but effectively it is doing a do intervention on X and kind of dropping the edges coming into X. And so when you're dropping the edges coming into X, good news is you get a stable estimator because in this graph that the surgery estimator produces or um, the graphical representation of the model that the surgery estimator produces, there are only black edges. So everything it's learning is stable, which is excellent news. On the flip side, you might say, well, it removed all the red edges on, on the flip side. In this example, it also removes a black edge, right? It removes this black edge, which is, means it's leaving some information at the table that is actually stable, that it could learn, that it's choosing not to learn. So 
in the class of interventional distributions, um, the surgery estimator is optimal, but the question is, could we do better? Like, is there a way in this example um, where we could uh, keep only, uh, keep all the black edges and remove only the red edge, right? So that's sort of the natural question. And then the answer is, turns out you can, uh, wouldn't be leaving you disappointed. But unfortunately, the answer is not that simple because so now we can move to this level three distributions with counterfactual distributions. So it turns out you can, which is good news. On the flip side, though, these are much, much harder to estimate. So there are many more assumptions we have to rely on in order to be able to get to a place where you can actually build an estimator of this kind. So Adarsh, actually, do you want to like walk through the counterfactual distribution to, you know, to intuitively give people an idea of how this works? Yeah, thanks. Um... So as we saw, we can do a little bit better by um, moving up the hierarchy. So we, we went from conditionals to interventions, and we saw that this let us um, sort of retain more of the, the stable edges. And so by moving one more step up the hierarchy, um, we can do that. And the way that we can see that is um, by kind of reasoning intuitively about what, what counterfactuals are, are doing on the graph. Um, where, where before we saw that um, with an intervention, um, because you're effectively you know, thinking about like setting the variable, that's what intervening means, um, you're deleting all the edges into it. But now what we want to do is we want to be able to consider um, sort of simultaneously like multiple interventions involving the same variable. So that is we want to consider um, kind of like conflicting, um, confl conflicting settings of variables that retain sort of um, separate pieces. So in the, in the graph that's uh, being shown here, we had this original graph that we've seen for this example. And before when we intervened on X, um, what we did was we deleted all, all edges into it um, and then essentially just keeping the effect of X onto Z. And so we can, we can still do that. So here um, at the bottom, we're noting this intervention and we're saying, I want to look at this value of Z had X been set to X. And so this this bottom portion where we have the square or the, the rectangle um, x equals to x, this is sort of the, this is exactly the same as what we saw on the slide before, where we're, we're saying the value that z would have had had we set x to its observed value. And so this is this, um, this idea of this intervention on x. But the different piece that we're introducing here is at the same time, we're actually going to, to take that um, value of x that we had, and we want to consider, you know, what would the value of x have been had um, sort of I, I gotten rid of y, had I, let's say, you know, set y equal to zero. And so if this actually corresponds to directly looking at that unstable edge, which um, is that edge from y to x, and saying, um, you know, irrespective of, of, of what I observed in my data, I want to actually consider a counterfactual, this hypothetical value of x, which is what would x have been had the value of y actually been zero instead of um, whatever it actually was. In the data, and so so that's this counterfactual notion of um, setting a variable to sort of a, a conflicting value in order to um, sort of preserve some of the information uh, while changing parts of it. So we're sort of removing the information that we have because of um, the observed value of y, um, but we are still retaining the value that corresponds to w. And so um, in the next slide, I think that's um, that's that's made explicit by looking at sort of across these two alternatives, uh, the surgery estimator, and then you know, one method for getting counterfactual distributions is this uh, counterfactual normalization. If we look with respect to the original graph, what we see is that the, the surgery estimator produces this do distribution, y given v, z, do x, that's stable, and it deleted these two edges, um, w to x and, and y to x, with respect to the original graph. But then with the, the counterfactual distribution, by considering the intervention on x, but then the counterfactual value of x um, under sort of changing or removing the effects of y, uh, we get this, this counterfactual distribution where we consider this counterfactual version of x, so y given v, z under the observed value of x, and then this counterfactual x under um, a different value of y. Um, that's also stable because no, we've deleted that, that red edge still, um, just like we did with the interventional distribution. But instead, we've actually managed to retain the edge from W to X. So there's this, um, there's this path that's retained that we had removed before with the interventional distribution. And so if we recall this principle of minimal deletion, 
then with respect to um, this example, with the counterfactual distribution, we've actually managed to, to satisfy this. We've only deleted the edge that was responsible for the shift and, and for the instability, this red edge, and we've managed to keep all the other pieces of the graph. And so um, this is why, um, this sort of demonstrates like the power of, of considering, you know, these higher, going up the hierarchy and, and what it lets you in terms of being able to um, retain uh, more of these stable dependencies. Is there anything you want to add, Suchi? Yeah, I think this is great. And I obviously, um, I, I think the, the main opportunity here is like this way of thinking opens up, you know, ways to develop new algorithms and in more complex in more complex examples, you know, how can we generalize and, you know, how can we estimate, um, develop estimators that are the highest level of the hierarchy in as general a setting as possible. Um, so we only have three more slides left. So I'm going to start kind of moving towards a wrap so that we can start moving to the um, panel or sorry, Q and A part of the uh, tutorial. And so the, Effectively, just to first start summarizing, um, you know, causality has a very important role to play. By taking this causal perspective, there are so many fascinating ideas that have opened up. Like first, being able to get guarantees against arbitrary shifts. Two, being able to, un uh, you know, even if you don't have the causal DAG, that's not a deal breaker. You can learn it from data by having a visual and graphical and intuitive representation, it allows you to start interacting with domain experts in order to start eliciting and taking more of a reliability engineering approach of understanding and reasoning about risks in your domain so that you can be more upfront and uh, thoughtful about what risks you're mitigating uh, and uh, protecting yourself from in building these models. Um, in addition to that, uh, you're thinking, um, in addition to that, we sort of said by taking this, um, you know, we need a way to start comparing these different classes of algorithms with respect to the stability accuracy trade-off, like the degree to which they're stable and the degree to which they're accurate given the stability guarantees they're giving. And within that class, um, the, you know, this notion of like different levels of the hierarchy um, and uh, different classes of operators that exist already in order to allow you to optimize the stability accuracy trade-off, um, but also identify where there's our uh, opportunity to develop new um, algorithms. And then to me, uh, most exciting here is how we took what I would have previously considered to be a really tricky problem where you literally are going, you like, you know, hospital, like in this application that others spoke about, I mean, hospitals are really messy places. People are running around doing all sorts of things. If you were to tell somebody, draw me a graph of how things are going on, that would be um, in its own right, a very scary task. But how we went from taking data from multiple hospitals, learning something that was interpretable, using then a domain, like, you know, using our domain expert to quickly identify what kinds of uh, dependencies or shifts we wanted to be um, immune to, which is sort of a very fundamental problem that many people, uh, like in this type of an example safety critical application, a big source of fear, which is for machine learning and AI adoption, where people think, well, what if, you know, it kills people. But now there, there's opportunity where we can actually basically start developing models where we can, you know, that are reliable and robust, that we can give some kind of failure proofing guarantees. And uh, I think others showed some really nice data on how one, we can recover these models. Two, we can start to see the stability accuracy trade-off where, you know, you can have multiple different types of stable models. Some are more accurate than others, depending on how conservative you're willing to be in terms of what types of dependencies you protect from. So it's kind of like a whole new language for being able to think about adding a notion of reliability to the and robustness to the models we're developing in machine learning. Um, so that's sort of a quick recap. Now, in terms of open problems, many, how can we, so continuously, how can we look inside methods, which learned, uh, you know, so we spoke about these different frameworks. It's not always easy to compare algorithms that are coming out of these different frameworks. So how can we make these different algorithms that are coming out of the framework, these three different frameworks that we spoke about, IRM, uh, 
reliable learning and um, um, what was the third one, Adarsh? I forget. Um, distribu bounded distribution robustness. Bounded distribution robustness and start making it easy to compare. Um, and so, and in particular, like for example, IRM, for instance, shows invariant representations that can cover at least stable conditional distributions. Not at all obvious. Like if you're interested in theory and you want to prove things, that'd be pretty cool. Where in the distribution, where in the stability hierarchy do they, do they sit, right? Do the resulting models, at least at level one, can they recover level two and level three? Like can we do that using the IRM framework? Um, and, um, you know, can we relax assumptions required for pr producing level three estimators? Like, so we gave you kind of factual normalization as one algorithm that operates under certain assumptions, but can we res relax those assumptions? And then this notion of mixed robustness, which is we spoke about our robustness to arbitrary shifts versus bounded robustness, but can the two, you know, be combined in which may be interesting and meaningful to do in certain data sets. And um, the last kind of thought Everything we spoke about thus far was all about developing methods for, um, you know, building models that are a priori robust. No matter how much work you do to do that, the reality is once you deploy them, you will learn new things about the world. And moreover, we need empirical checks. We need some ways to be able to understand if we can truly trust. Uh, you know, or or other assumptions we made, which in the real world don't hold. So you want to pair it up with the strategy for monitoring, uh, which you know was not a section we covered in great levels of detail. But um, and I had pointed to another tutorial, but I think that's actually another area where there's lots of interesting ways in which we can pair up what monitoring we're doing, and then that inspires ideas, new ideas for robustness that we currently aren't thinking about. So to end. Um, I hope uh, this is sort of what I promised we would cover in this tutorial. I think we've covered all of the above, but if there are questions, we're happy to take it.